Madam Court of Common Pleas is now open pursuant to adjournment. The Honorable Judge Brendan J. Okay. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, no. Okay, uh, good morning. Uh, we're here today on uh, the state of Ohio versus uh, Crystal Candelario. That's you, Ms. Candelario. This is case number 23682241. Um, representing Ms. Candelaria is uh, Mr. Derek Smith and Mr. PJ Mulligan. And representing the state of Ohio is Ms. Anna Ferrelia and Ms. Jordan Mason. So we're here today for a sentencing hearing. Um, Ms. Candelaria, on February the 22nd, you pled guilty to count one, which is titled aggravated murder, an unclassified felony, which is potential sentence of life with parole eligibility after 20 years, life with parole eligibility after 25 years, life with parole eligibility after 30 years, or life without parole. You also pled guilty to count five, endangering children, which is a felony of the second degree, which is punishable by two to eight years, and or a $15,000 fine. And there's also the Reagan Tokes advisements I advised you of, which is whatever sentence this court imposes on count five must be served 50% of that number. So we went through that at the plea, so you understand that. Um, at that time of the plea, uh, we requested a pre-sentence investigation report. Uh, we received a report from Michael Rahm, R-A-H-M, uh, on February the 28th. I shared it with both the state and the defense. Um, Ms. Ferrelia, Mr. Smith, have you had a chance to review this report? I have, Your Honor. Yes, we have. Any additions or corrections to this report? Right? No, Your Honor. No, Your Honor. Um, I also have received uh, sentencing memorandums and mitigation reports um, from the defense by Mr. Smith and Mr. Milligan. And I also received a state sentencing memorandum by Ms. Ferrelia. With that being said, is there anything, any additions or corrections that this court needs to review? With regards to the briefs, no, Your Honor. The briefs, yes. No, Your Honor. Um, Ms. Candelaria, are you ready to proceed to sentencing? Yes, Your Honor. That being said, um, this is the procedure we're going to follow. Um, I'm going to turn to the state first. Ms. Fralia, you'll put on uh, your sentencing uh, uh, hearing and allow you to present evidence and uh, victim impact statements. And then when I hear from the state and all the state's representatives, I'll turn to the defense. I'll hear from you, Mr. Smith, and uh, anyone who wishes to speak on behalf of Ms. Candelaria. And then I'll hear from you, Ms. Candelario, and then I'll impose my sentence, okay? That's how we're going to operate. So with that being said, Ms. Frelia, are you ready to proceed then? I am, Your Honor. Thank you. Good morning, Your Honor. We're here on a very tragic case. The state of Ohio has prepared a PowerPoint presentation because the state wants you, when you impose your sentence, that you look at Crystal Candelaria's actions. And anybody that knows me or has been in this courthouse would know that I talk about actions in all my cases because as adults, we are responsible for our actions and there are consequences to our actions. So let us begin on this faithful day that, uh, that Jaylene Candelaria lost her life. If, in fact, we would have gone to trial, the evidence was going to show that Crystal Candelaria left the state of Ohio on 6-4, 2023. 
She leaves because there is a receipt that's found in her car that she is in Taylor, Michigan. Unbeknownst to Ms. Candelario, her neighbors had ring doorbell and the Cleveland Police Department Homicide Unit has gone through 648 hours and videos of the ring doorbell, which you're going to see in this presentation. With regards to Ms. Candelaria, she returns to Cuyahoga County on 6-6 at 7.41 a.m. So at this particular point, we have reason to believe that this child was left alone for two days now, and she returns on 6-6-2023. Additional cameras show her again at 11.51 on 6-6, and on 5.24 of 6-6, She is taking a suitcase and now leaving Cuyahoga County. We have a map and a flock camera which shows her on, I believe it's uh, Lafayette and Charter northbound at 66 at 20.05, which is 8.05 p.m. And that's a flock camera. Through the search warrants, we were able to retrieve her Spirit airline tickets that showed her departure and her return from Puerto Rico. She was gone from 6-8 to 6-11. And it's interesting, Your Honor, because in the defense memorandum, it says that her abrupt stopping of medications played a significant role in her ability to function as a parent and make sound decisions. So when we look at, these are items from her phone, her actions indicate to us that she is in Puerto Rico having a good time with friends and that there is not a care in the world about the 16-month-old that was left alone in the pack and play. These pictures show somebody who is showing some discretion and judgment because she's having a good time. Meanwhile, this child is in a pack and play. While she is in Puerto Rico, the detectives were able to locate on the door, on the ring doorbell, that on 6-9-2023 at around 1.04 a.m. in the morning that you hear this child crying. So now we have Miss Candelaria's car. She's returned from Michigan, uh, from Puerto Rico, back to Michigan, where she was with one fellow, and then traveled to go see another fellow in Trinidad. 
traveled to Imolay, Michigan to be with another fellow. So that's from 612 to 615. Her car is found on all these flawed cameras. Not once is she returning to Cuyahoga County. Now we turn our attention to June 16th at 7.36 a.m. She is back in Cuyahoga County. Her car reappears in front of her house. She goes in and she finds her daughter dead. She takes the time to redress her and then she calls 911. <laughs>
And we have this good interpreter that has been with us during this whole case. This is the very first interview, the crying of the 911, and this is the first interview that she has with a detective from homicide. Again, pay attention to her actions and how she speaks to this detective. Uh, but in the last week, she gave a bombing to uh, remember right now when you mentioned the bombing. Uh, she got a bombing in the last week, Monday and Tuesday, two uh -huh. times. But I was trying controlling because I know I give to her Tylenol or something, you know, for yeah. uh, for controlling the bombing. Okay. Um, Come on, this is my supervisor, Sergeant Coleman. I'm very too. I give to her when she gets a little bit of Hola, ¿qué tal? Entonces, Just to take note, Your Honor. Um, so yeah, that's the situation. And, and after that, she, she, she was refusing to do the food and she was with no appetite. I say, oh my God. This and is he, after last Monday and Tuesday yeah, when she was yeah, throwing up? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Are you um, talking about Monday and Tuesday like four yeah. days ago? Yeah, yeah, okay. last week, yes. Okay. Yes. Because we almost done this week, so I talk about, yeah. This because week. what this week? This week. Yeah, I talk okay. about it because we almost done, you know, the Oh, we're almost done with this. Week. Yeah. Okay. All right, so that was just Monday and Tuesday of this week. She was throwing up. Yes. And then how was she Wednesday and Thursday? She was with no uh, with no food, just with a meal because uh, she was refusing. Maybe it's because she got a one meal two days, like, you know, before. Yeah. So that's why what, what? I was scary because I say, oh my God, maybe go to the hospital because she doesn't eat anything. And I, she was lose tiny, you know, her yeah. weight. I lose, you know, her weight. But right now, in this morning when I wake up, she was asleep. She sleep every day 12 hours. Okay. She sleep like at 9, 8 p.m. Okay. through 9 or 10 a.m. Okay. 12 hours. So, in this morning, I was sleeping too. I never wake up. She was up. What, what happened? How, what was going on last night? Last night she was crying a lot. And I see one moment when I was a uh, take a shower, me, and she was uh, she was screaming like ah, I don't know, probably she get a pain. Okay. Maybe. About what time was that last night? Uh maybe at seven or eight p.m. Okay. So she was screaming like a, you know, probably with, for pain or something like that. Um, in this morning when I wake up, you know, I take I took her in the morning for a day, wake up, da, 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 da. and she wake up and, and when I see her, I see she looks like a really really uh dry like a, ¿cómo se dice cuando una persona se se chupa o sea se right. And then she is then brought into homicide, she's arrested and brought into homicide and has another conversation with um, Sergeant Gomez and Detective Powell and she continues now to perpetuate her lies. What time did you go to uh, Detroit, Michigan on Monday? Monday morning. Okay. On Monday morning, what condition um, was <coughs> Jaylene in? She was okay. She was okay? Was she uh, awake, asleep? No, she wasn't sleeping. She was sleeping in the house? Sorry. <coughs>
Jesús llega y dice la prueba porque no era tuya para decirnos la verdad. Porque nosotros vamos a leer el video. Sí, el y si no nos está diciendo la verdad, lo vamos a ver. Y claro. vamos, a, vamos a ver que tú no estás mintiendo. Sí, y él está diciendo que va a haber más problemas al respecto. Va a empezar los problemas. So, Your Honor, with regards to Jaylene Cal Candelario, she died a very awful death for being 16 months old. Dr. Elizabeth Mooney from the medical examiner's office is here and would like to make a statement. She was the medical examiner that did the autopsy, and the state of Ohio is going to provide you uh, the autopsy and autopsy photographs to make this part of the sentencing record. Good morning. Hi, doctor. For the record, can you uh, say your name and spell it for the court reporter? Yes, my name is Dr. Elizabeth Mooney, and it's spelled M-O-O-N-E-Y. I am currently employed by Cuyahoga County Medical Examiner's Office as a forensic pathologist and deputy medical examiner. In this capacity, I was assigned the task of performing an autopsy on little girl Jalen Candelario in order to determine her cause and manner of death. Unfortunately, this is one of the most tragic and unfortunate cases I've had in my career thus far. So today I speak on behalf of her and her findings with the course of my examination. We received Jalen at the medical examiner's office from the scene of her residence, at which time she was clothed in non-soiled clothing, uh, indicating her body had likely been dressed prior to first responders' arrival, as they had mentioned before. So at autopsy, I examined uh, the body of a very emaciated female toddler. At this point, she weighed 13 pounds. Upon review of medical records, this indicated approximately a seven pound weight loss since her previous doctor's visit less than two months prior to that. The eyes were sunken and she had temporal wasting in her face. In addition to that, the skin showed markedly decreased turgor, meaning when I pinch the skin, it remains in that tented position, indicating severe dehydration. In addition, there was abundant fecal material, present caked on the fingers, the fingernails, the hands, the feet, as well as the soles of the feet. The same material was found on her lips, which were very dry and flaking, as well as in her oral cavity, kick to her teeth. She did have some diaper rash appearance, um, as well as fecal material adherent to those areas. Of note, the body was essentially free of significant injury, with the exception of dried excoriations or scratches to the face region predominantly, and whether or not these were inflicted to herself in a conscious or semi-conscious state while she was dying, I'm unable to determine that. Very early decompositional changes were present. This included faint discoloration or green discoloration of the abdomen. These are typically changes that we see within two to three days following death. No additional changes to suggest that she passed away prior to this were found externally or internally. Upon internal examination, I continued to find evidence consistent with starvation and dehydration. These included pale discoloration of the musculature, which was minimal. There was a decrease in intra-abdominal fat to the point of transparency as her body tried to feed upon itself for nutrients. Her stomach contents consisted of less than two milliliters of brown mucoid material. This is about uh, equivalent to the distal part of my thumb, a very small amount. The rest of her bowel just contained patchy fecal material, but very minimal throughout. Her organs, including her liver, kidneys, and thymic gland, showed evidence of stress, specifically microscopically on exam. I found no additional evidence of significant natural disease going on or congenital abnormalities. Following my exam, I submitted body fluids for additional toxicology and chemistry testing, which further confirmed my gross findings that she had passed in a state of severe dehydration. Her kidneys had failed, and she was in a state of ketoacidosis, which leads to coma and eventually death. As such, I determined the cause of death to be just that, starvation and severe dehydration due to pediatric neglect. 
to come to the ex exact wording of the cause of death was based on my findings, but also the medical definitions, which I'd like to reiterate here. Dehydration and specifically starvation is a lengthy and continuous deprivation of food as to cause suffering or death. Pediatric neglect is the failure of a caregiver to meet adequately a child's basic needs, including physical safety, protection, food, clothing, shelter, education, medical or dental care, and supervision. In other words, neglect for Jalen's basic needs from a caregiver from a caregiver resulted in her death. As such, I ruled this manner to be homicide. Most homicide deaths involve acts of violence inflicted from one person onto another. But this case involves a failure to act appropriately to support another who is dependent on them, falling into a homicidal manner. In the absence of more advanced decompositional changes, I believe that the pain and suffering she endured lasted not only hours, not days, but possibly even a week. This is a pain that comes from an extreme thirst and hunger. It also stems from an inherent terror of isolation or the lack of someone present to provide that. My knowledge on the depth of this suffering may not be as extensive as a medical or a mental health professional, but as a physician with psychiatric and pediatric training, I feel comfortable stating that the deprivation of food coupled with physical isolation and caregiver abandonment would be terrifying. We know that babies and children cry when they're hungry because it's unsettling and it's uncomfortable. That's almost immediately after birth. We also know that children as early as age four to five months experience separation anxiety with the most extreme anxiety around nine to 18 months. Jalen was 16 months old. This feeling of abandonment for days on end, coupled with the pain of starvation and extreme thirst, is a type of suffering I don't think any of us could ever fully fathom. So as a forensic pathologist, it is said that we are the voice of the dead and given the responsibility to speak for those who can't. So this morning, I'm honored to maintain that mission. Thank you. In addition, Your Honor, just so the record is very clear, the state of Ohio has tried repeatedly to contact Jalen's extended family, and absolutely no one has called the prosecutor's office, has returned a call from the prosecutor's office, um, has done nothing to acknowledge that Jalen was even part of their family. So if people come in this morning, it's going to be on the side of Crystal Candelaria, because on the part of Jaylene, in addition to Dr. Mooney, who speaks for the dead through autopsy findings, uh, Sergeant Teresa Gomez and Detective T.J. Powell are going to speak to you. As you also look behind me, it is law enforcement, whether it be from Cleveland Homicide, from the FBI, from the district, from EMS. These are all the people that participated in this case and that they are here to be the family for Jaylene Candelario because her own family did not have the courage to call the prosecutor's office and ask what was going on with their case. They were more concerned with their own daughter. Uh, TJ is going to, oh, Sergeant is going to speak first. Do <coughs> you want her to come to the podium? Absolutely. Same thing, Sergeant. Just uh, say your name and spell it for our court reporter so she can have an accurate spell. Teresa Gomez, T E R E S A G O M E Z. Good morning, Your Honor. Your Honor, thank you for allowing me to be the voice for Jaylene Candelario, a beautiful angel whose life was cut short for no good reason. This tragedy should have never happened. I am Sergeant Gomez from the Homicide Unit. The entire Homicide Unit, Cleveland Homicide Initiative, and our partners from the FBI are here today in honor of baby J. Lee Candelario. When we were first notified of this horrific case, we were all heartbroken. But when we started digging deeper into the investigation, it was beyond horrific. 
It was revealed that the defendant, Crystal Candelario, left her own child alone for hours, which led to days, which led to weeks. The 16-month-old baby was left alone in a pack of play to fend for herself for 11 days with no food, maybe milk, the clothing she had on, and the diaper she was wearing. This baby loved her mother. She needed her mother, and her mother betrayed her. Mothers usually want their children to have a long, happy life, but Candelario placed more importance on a vacation in Puerto Rico with her boyfriend than the health, safety, and well-being of her own daughter. She chose to satisfy her own needs and desires over that of her own child. Jaylene's life ended because of her selfishness and disregard for Jaylene's precious life. Candelario violated Jaylene yet again when she placed her little body in a clean outfit in order to orchestrate this facade that she was trying to portray for the investigators, either before or after she called 911. The Jaylene told us something different when we saw her eyes sunk in and wide open. We later learned that sunken eyes is a result of severe dehydration. To the naked eye, it appears she had dirt in her mouth and fingernails. It wasn't until the next day that detectives learned that the dirt in fact was feces. Detectives also began to gain clarity as to what really happened to Jaylene. Candelario's fabricated story, which she initially told detectives, began to unravel. There's no way things could have happened the way the defendant said they did, which left us with many unanswered questions. Detectives gained knowledge of the fact that Candelario left Jaylene by herself for more than 10 days. Many hours of video surveillance revealed all of the comings and goings of Candelario from June 5th through June 16th of 2023 when she discovered her daughter deceased. Investigators watched a total of 628 surveillance videos, which also included audio. On June 9th, audio, audio surveillance captured the final time Jaylene is ever heard crying. Myself and the people sitting behind me, many who are mothers and fathers, are tormented by the thought of what Jaylene endured and what her last hours on earth were like. Any of us and thousands of others would have jumped at the opportunity to take care of this beautiful little girl. Jaylene died a long and agonizing death, afraid and alone while her mother enjoyed the beach and sunshine. This is a case that myself, all the people behind me, and everyone around the world will have branded in our minds and in our hearts forever. Jaylene took her last breath, and our only hope is that Jaylene found herself in the arms of Jesus, feeling his warm embrace and love, something she did not receive from her mother. Jaylene, you will never be forgotten. Detective T.J. Paul, P-O-W-E-L-L, Science of the Cleveland Police Homicide Unit. Um, I was the lead detective investigator on this case, and I can honestly say, Your Honor, in my 17-year career as a Cleveland police officer, this by far is the most horrific case I've ever had to investigate. Being a, now, I've been a detective for 10 years. Um, first and foremost, I want to thank the entire homicide unit, the entire Cleveland Police Department prosec prosecutor's office. As you see, we're here, we're Jaylene's voice. Um, unfortunately, there's no family on our side, but we're her family. I wrote a short poem, just something in commemoration of Jaylene's life. J is for the justice that'll be received today. A is for the angel wings she earned on that dreadful day. I is for the incremental repetition build up of suspense for an innocent bystander's death that clearly makes no sense. 
L is for the lack of love while alone for 11 days. Y is for a young life that was taken away. N is for new eternal life Jaylene gained on that day. No child should ever have to die this way. Jaylene's life truly mattered. Unfortunately, she died trying to survive off of her own urine and fecal matter. Lastly, Your Honor, you're going to hear that Ms. Candelaria was depressed. And no one more than I appreciate mental health and mental health issues and the programs that this court and my office have tried to implement to help folks with mental health. This is not the case here. This is not the case at all. Her actions speak louder than words. She had the wherewithal to leave Cuyahoga County and drive to Detroit to be not with one man, but with two, let alone leaving a child, her own flesh and blood, in a pack and play. And during the time that she has been locked up, she has been making plans for the future, talking to other folks at other jails, other prisons. She had a conversation, which I find more disturbing than not, but on November 26, 2023, instead of wrought with emotion, wrought with guilt, crying about the death of her child, she's talking what talking um, with a friend about her trip to Puerto Rico and what a blast it was and how much the car cost and they got a truck versus a car even though it was more expensive and they were concerned about the other woman that was on the trip because she liked to spend money and they spent money on food. There was never mention about her daughter in her phone calls and in fact on January 6th of 2024 she's talking to her mother who she repeatedly talks to and they talk about God, God, God is forgiving, God is this. You also have to take responsibility for your actions. And God isn't in the courtroom. That's why we have judges, and that's why we have the law, because we have to follow the law. But this is what she says, because, you know, she wants to make us believe that she doesn't understand the English language. She goes on to say, there are people who have gone free here, killing people. I mean, imagine. I mean, intentionally, and mine was practically one, I mean, an accident. I mean, because it was not like I did it intentionally. It's not like I picked up a gun or a bat or the girl bled or something like that. That's it. It was practically the same thing that happened to me a few days prior. I had had the same thing happen to me days prior. And I mean that day that it happened, that same situation happened. Were you starved when you were in Puerto Rico, Miss Candelaria? Did you not have a glass of water to drink when your mouth was parched? It is really pretty pathetic, Your Honor. Because, you know, we always stand before you and say that the purposes and principles of sentencing are to punish the offender and to protect the public. And, you know, in the sentencing memorandum, the defense says, well, she's not going to do it again. Well, no, she's not going to do it again because she's going to prison. But it's the fact that she did it in the beginning that sticks with us. You don't do that. She was a mother. She got a title that means something in this world. Animals take care of their infants better. The thought of this child dying every day while she's having fun, humanity can't stomach that. And those are the actions that need to be punished. She abandoned her daughter and left her for dead. 
So, yeah, she didn't see blood. She didn't see the aftermath of a baseball bat. But what she did see were her eyes open, looking at her, saying, why did you do this to me? Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, may it please the court, everything that I'm about to get into here today, and my client agrees with me, <laughs> is no justification for her actions. And what the prosecution said, actions matter, and these actions are narcissistic, selfish, abhorrent, absolutely worst parenting imaginable. She pled to aggravated murder. She pled to child endangering. So everything we're about to tell you is, is mitigation. Just to kind of give you an understanding of who this person is. So she came over um, from Ecuador 20, 2016 with a grandmother. She was here for a few years. Her parents came over and they lived together. She had her first daughter, Amaya, while she was married, she subsequently got divorced, was a single mom raising Amaya, met the father of Jaylene in Ecuador. Um, they had a relationship that unfortunately turned violent. While she was pregnant with Jaylene, he became physical with her. She came back to Cleveland, never see him again, gave birth to Jaylene. He was never involved in Jaylene's life. She had two daughters on her with the help of her parents. She was struggling emotionally, physically, trying to work, support these children. Fast forward to 2023, it's overwhelming. She even tried to harm herself, took 20 Motrin, ended up in Metro. Um, in early February of 23, after spending just a few days in her room alone, her mother went to check on her, asked her what was going on. Her whole side of her body was numb. Didn't know what was going on. They took her to Hillcrest Hospital. She was admitted there. And they were doing some uh, evaluations for you know, her migraines. She was complaining about headaches and weakness, facial drooping, thought it was a possible stroke. They put her on IV Depakote, which is a anti-seizure, also used to treat manic disorder. And at the end of the day, after evaluations, she was clean, nothing wrong with her brain. They gave her oral Depakote and Effexor, two antidepressants, and sent her home. She was not very clear on what those were, but she was taking them supposedly as directed. And then she returned to Hillcrest Hospital again in March, and there was a note from the doctor saying that she should have had plenty of effects her, but she's saying that she's she's out and she needs more and she's coming back with the same problems. So they had her evaluated again, and they were saying that her anxiety and her stress was the trigger for these physical manifestations to what was happening to her, for the loss of sensation in the side of her body, the numbness. And they prescribed her more Depakote, more effects her, and also Adorax to help her sleep, because she wasn't sleeping. And this is in March of 2023. And, you know, take the medications as prescribed. And then, medications ran out. She wasn't feeling any better, they weren't working, she stopped. Not supposed to do that with these drugs, Your Honor. These are very serious mental health drugs. And you need to be tapered off of these medications or there could be some side effects not only the side effects, but the actual underlying conditions that she may have had or been suffering from are also going unmedicated at this time. And then we get into to her trip. And to be honest, I'm, I'm not going through that again. That's the worst thing I've ever heard. And I commend the prosecution and the Duchess for their work. It was unimaginable, terrible. And I, I feel for all you guys having to deal with that too, and her family as well. It's when the prosecution you know, showed pictures of her on her trip, pictures can be deceiving. Um, personally, for having myself suffer from depression and anxiety, you can't, you can't tell 
what a person's going through from a picture, what they're dealing with on the inside. And I'm thankful for the support that I had from my family, my friends, my doctors. She didn't have any of that. She was hiding it from herself, from her parents. Her, nobody knew what she was suffering from. They, her doctors even thought it was migraines and possible strokes. And to be honest with you, when I first met her, Your Honor, after this happened in June, I met, I met a person that was devoid of emotion. Just why, after hearing what had happened on the news, and then I get the call, she wants to meet with me, and I go talk to her, it was not what I expected. Is this she had no emotion. I, she couldn't explain anything. I had no idea who I was talking to. But I'll tell you right now, this is not the same person. This person now is compliant on her medications. She's been taking them with the, through the prison throughout the whole time that she's been in here. <clears throat> you know, I, again, I'll go again, there's no justification for her action when she was out there, what she was doing. She could have called somebody, she could have done this, yes, but when you're in that state, when you're off medication, mismanaging your thoughts, you, you're not thinking clearly, her body just, she had to get out, and she, she was having fun, if she was okay, in her mind, Jaylene was okay. But, no, of course that was, that's not the case, but I will point to when she did finally get home and we heard that 911 call she she didn't want this to happen you could hear that screaming help me my daughter's dying yes because of your actions because of what your choices were and you took responsibility for that but that that call that that one tiny breach from whatever was going on in her head, that reality that her daughter was dying. She was calling for help. She didn't want that. And again, Your Honor, she took responsibility. She pled an aggravated murder. She pled a child endangering. Nothing's going to bring Jaylene back. She knows that. So then, yeah, after the fact, she, in her state, she was telling detectives whatever. She thought she had another daughter. She had a Maya she had to think about. And she had her, her parents. And then the prosecution saying that nobody's here on, on behalf of Jaylene, that's wrong. Her parents are here, they love that girl. They love Jaylene, her mother loved Jaylene. She didn't deserve what happened to her. Nobody does. But they're here to talk on behalf of Jaylene as well, they loved her. So this time around I'd like to call her parents up to, to say sure. Crystal creció y se formó. Uh, Crystal uh, grew up and was educated en un ambiente sano junto a sus padres. In a um, healthy environment uh, together with her parents. Protegida y amada. Protected and loved. Realizó sus estudios en nuestro país natal, Ecuador. Uh, she um, uh, she um, uh, studied and was educated in our native country of Ecuador. Escogiendo la misma profesión de su abuelo y sus padres. Uh, and she chose the same profession as her um, father's and her grandfather. La docencia. Um, teaching. Um, her emotional health was affected on more than one occasion. Pero entre trabajo, responsabilidades y el día a día. Uh, but between her work, um, her other responsibilities, and her day-to-day -day life. En un ir y venir no logró priorizar la importancia de un tratamiento continuo. In the middle of all that, she never uh, ended up uh, prioritizing um, or appreciating the importance of uh, continued treatment. Por lo que la depresión y la ansiedad y el trastorno de neurosis de conversión fueron ganando terreno en su vida. And because of all that, uh, her uh, depression, anxiety, um, her um, um, conversion uh, neurosis um, disorder uh, all ended up um, consuming her. Razón uh, por la que siempre sufría desmayos y pérdida del conocimiento. And as a result of this, she uh, uh, suffered um, fainting spells and also loss of consciousness. Con esto no quiero victimizar ni justificar a nadie. In saying this, I don't want to victimize or justify anyone. Solo mirar el yo interior de quien hoy está aquí sentada y siendo juzgada. I only want to give a glimpse of the um, uh, interior person, the ego, 
uh, of someone who is uh, seated here and who is being judged. The um, sickness, uh, a mental health uh, illness, is not reflected in someone's, fa in someone's face. Ni en una foto. And also not in a picture, in a photo. Nunca nadie imaginó que este sufrimiento terminaría en tragedia. No one ever imagined that this suffering would uh, culminate in a tragedy. Y hoy aquí, quiero decirle a Jailin, and uh, here I'm here, nuestro I'm, ángel, Jailin, I want to say here before uh, uh, Jailin, our angel, tu recuerdo vive en nosotros. that uh, your memory lives within us. Siempre te amaremos. We will always love you. Te acuné en mis brazos. I uh, held you in my arms. Tus abuelos nunca te olvidarán. Your uh, grandparents will never forget you. Perdóname, bebé. Uh, um, forgive me. Uh, uh, Por vivir la oscuridad del conocimiento. For uh, being in the dark. Que me imposibilitó ver la luz y poder ayudar a tu madre. In, uh, dark, the darkness that prevented me from seeing the light to see what was going on with your mother. Pido misericordia. I ask for mercy, clemency, and for compassion. Para un ser humano. For a human being. Que ha librado una dura batalla en su vida. That has waged a very difficult battle in her life. Y ruego no satanizarla. And uh, I beg that you not. Ni señalarla. I beg that you not demonize her and point the finger at her. ¿Quién en esta vida no ha pecado contra Dios? Who in this life has not sinned against God? Que levanten la mano quienes no lo han hecho. Anyone who hasn't, uh, let them raise their hand. Pero como creemos en un Dios de amor y de bondad. Uh, but since we believe in a, um, de, in, a, in, a, in a God of love and of goodness. En un, adio, en un Dios de perdón. And a God of forgiveness. Él está aquí con nosotros. He is here with us. Hija, te amo. Uh, my daughter, I Aquí love estaré you. siempre para ti. Uh, we're here always for you. Te voy a esperar toda la vida. I'm going to wait for the rest of my life for you. Señores, excelentísimo jueces de la corte. Honorable judges of the court. Estoy aquí conternado por todo lo sucedido. I am shocked by everything that happened. Dándole apoyo moral y espiritual a nuestra hija. And I am giving moral and spiritual support Señores jueces, to our daughter, las enfermedades mentales y emocionales no avisan. Mental and emotional illness does not give warning. Cada persona es un mundo. Each person is a world unto herself. Y el mundo interior de mi hija and the inner world of se my was shaken. Sin darnos cuenta, without our having realized it. La depresión, la ansiedad, depression, la envolvieron hasta hacerle perder el juicio y la razón. Depression and anxiety consumed her to the point of depriving her of good judgment and reason. Aquí está mi hija Crystal, que también tiene un motivo sí. Sí. para seguir adelante. Here is my daughter Crystal, who also has a motive to go forward with your help. Con la ayuda de ustedes y esa razón, with your help and with this motive, se llama Amaya. Her name is Amaya. Que tiene siete años. She is seven years old. Y espera ver a su madre. And she hopes to y abrazarla. See and she hopes to see her mother and hug her very soon. Muy pronto. Very soon. Jailin es nuestra luz. Jailin is the light of our life. Amaya 
es nuestra esperanza. Amaya is our hope. Te amo, hija. I love you, my daughter. Hasta el final de mis días. Until the end of my days. May God give you strength and courage. Gracias. Every day of your life. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Your Honor, good morning. There's so much pain that I have in regards to the loss of my baby, Jimmy. I'm extremely hurt about everything that happened. I am not trying to justify my actions. Pero nadie sabe cuánto yo estaba sufriendo. But nobody knew how much I was suffering. Y por lo que estaba pasando. And what I was going through. Todos los días le pido perdón a Dios y a mi hija, Jailene. Every day I ask forgiveness from God and from my daughter, Jailene. Soy una persona creyente de Dios. I'm a person who believes in God. Y reconozco hoy que todos y and todas muchas ocasiones somos tentados por el enemigo. And I recognize uh, today that all, me, all of us, uh, are sometimes uh, subject to the enemy. Dios y mi hija me han perdonado. God and my daughter have forgiven me. Quisiera pedir perdón también a mi hija Amaya. I would also have, uh, like to ask Amaya, my daughter Amaya, for forgiveness. Y a mis padres. And I'd have, like to ask my parents for no se imaginan cuánto yo era unida a mi hija Yailin Yamaya. Uh, one can't imagine um, how close I was to my daughters um, Jailin and Amaya. Y cuánto nos amábamos todas. And how much we all uh, loved one another. Extraño mucho a mis hijas. I miss my daughters very much. Hoy nada puede devolverme a Maya. Ah, Jaylene, perdón. Uh, now, I, I know that nothing, um, nothing can bring Jaylene back. Y no pasa un día que no deje de pensar en ella. And not a day goes by when I do not think of her. Le pido a Dios que algún día pueda volverla a ver. I pray to God that one day I will see her again. Y poder retornar junto con Amaya, que es nuestra única esperanza el día de hoy. And I pray also that one day I can be reunited with Amaya, who is uh, our only hope right now. Thank you, Susan. Your honor. Thank you, Your Honor. Ms. Candelaria, you might as well stand up. Um, court has to impose a sentence here today and the first thing a judge has to do is look at the purposes and principles of sentencing 
That is, the sentence must comply with these purposes and principles under our revised code 2929.11a. The overriding purposes is to punish the offender and protect the public from future crime by this offender and others using the minimum sanctions that the court determines accomplishes this purpose without imposing an unnecessary burden on state or local government resources. I always have to consider the need for incapacitation, deterrence, rehabilitation, and restitution. The sentence should be commensurate with and not demeaning to the seriousness of the offender's conduct, its impact on the victims, and consistent with sentences for similar crime by similar offenders. Ms. Candelaria, I am not sentencing you today based on your race, your ethnicity, your gender, or your religion. Do you understand that? Yes. I sat here, listened, and I'm looking in the back of this courtroom, and I think of Dr. Mooney's statements to me, Sergeant Detective Teresa Gomez and Sergeant or Detective Powell and these three experienced, very talented, hardworking individuals all called this one of the most horrific cases they've ever seen. I look in the back of this courtroom and I see law enforcement, I see individuals who have worked on this case who are here because it's also affected them and how horrific this crime is. It stunned people across this world because it defies one of the basic human responsibilities. The bond between a mother and a child is one of the most purest and most sacred bonds between human beings. It's a relationship built on love, trust, and unwavering protection. Yet, in a shocking and betrayal of this fundamental trust, you committed the ultimate act of betrayal, leaving your baby terrified, alone, unprotected, to suffer what I heard was the most gruesome death imaginable, with no food, no water, no protection, and lying in her own feces. Ms. Candelaria, you know the responsibility of parenthood. You have a child already. You raise another child. And I've witnessed here before me your parents who showed you love and respect and education. And they came here to help you, to advocate for you more than what you've done for your own child. The evidence that I've witnessed here before this court shows that this time you simply chose not to be here because you wanted to have fun. You decided you needed a vacation. And what followed was absolute depravity. You left your baby, Jalen, trapped in a pack and play without food, and water for 10 days. This 
wasn't simply an oversight. You could have saved Jalen's life many times. You could have found someone to watch her while you were gone. You could have taken her with you. While you were in Detroit or Puerto Rico, you could have called someone in Cleveland and told them that Jalen needed help. Dr. Moody indicated that rigor mortis was found when they found her, which means she hasn't been, she didn't die that long before you came home. Think about that. Despite all of her suffering, that little baby persevered, waiting for someone to save her. And you could have done that with a simple phone call. Instead, I see photos of you on a beach while your child was eating her own feces in an attempt to survive. Photos mean something. And I'm well aware of mental health. But it didn't look like you were too concerned about your child. As if that wasn't bad enough, you extended your stay in Detroit without regard to Jalen, alone, in pain, clawing her face in distress from the exhibits I just looked at, trapped in a tiny prison that you left her in. When you got home, you knew enough to start lying. You could cock this story after story, trying to hide what you did. You even put pants on her, but you couldn't hide the absolute horror and filth that she spent the last days of her life in. You still didn't get it. I hear this morning that you went out and managed to go out with someone that you were with, and he was too upset to eat, but you weren't. And then I hear that you're in jail and you're telling people, well, I can't wait to get home. I look at remorse. I hear, except for the acceptance of responsibility, no remorse. As a court, I have to remember Jalen, where you did not. Just as you didn't let Jalen out of her confinement until she died, so too, you should spend the rest of your life in a cell without freedom. The only difference will be that prison will at least feed you and give you liquids that you deny her. Based on all these factors, and based on all the things I've looked at, and I'm marking this as State's Exhibit 1 for the court reporter. On count one, aggravated murder, I'm going to sentence you to life in prison without the possibility of parole. On count five, I'm going to sentence you to eight years to run concurrent to count one. I'm going to tell you, Crystal, this is probably one of the most difficult, horrific cases to listen to, to hear, and to see. And I can tell you that I appreciate the fact that the state of Ohio presented this matter in a professional way and the defense has acted in a professional way. You have a right to appeal my sentence. Do you have the money or means to hire a lawyer at this time?
No. All right. I'll appoint the uh, award. I'll appoint a lawyer to represent her on appeal. What else? Um, and at the endangering children because of the Reagan Tokes thing, it would be eight to twelve years. Um, that would be concurrent with the aggravated murder which is life without girls. Is there anything else, uh, Mr. Smith, on the effort defense? Nothing further. Anything on the effort? No, Your Honor. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Court's adjourned.